start recording. So, okay. So we begin with prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we come before you today. We thank you for these opportunities we have to open your word. We ask, Father, for your blessing. We ask that your angels may guide us, direct our thoughts, direct our conversations, help us now that as we look upon this example, that we may come to understand that which we are to know and that which we will see in the experience of the first, second, and third angel's message for our time. Be with us now that are joined in this meeting. Be with those that will view this later. Help us now in all ways. For this we thank you, for this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I am going to begin. We'll do a quick overview. Okay. Quick review of what we had we talked about the last time. Which was two weeks ago. <laughs> right. I know. I know. That's good reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we were dealing with Esther 8. And as we're going to go through this quickly, Esther 8.1. On that day did King Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jews, enemy unto Esther, the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. So in other words, it's not until this point mm -hmm. that the king understands that Mordecai is Esther's uncle. Yeah. So we have <clears throat> Esther spake again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. And we know that this was to cause the destruction of the Jews. Yeah. But Haman did not have the clue that this destruction would also involve Esther. He just wanted to get at Mordecai. He wanted to get at the other people of the Jewish nation, he didn't understand that the queen that he was to revere was also Jewish. Yeah, and um, now Esther, of course, could have hit all that if she wanted to, maybe, um, but she chose not to. Right. Excuse me. Now, then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. Now, this is the same situation that we saw in Esther 4.11. Mm -hmm. when this, and, and in 5.2. Mm -hmm. So we came to understand that when that scepter is held out, the party could approach, right? Yeah. And it's now, symbolic of something. Okay. But have we decided what it's symbolic about? I don't know if we have as a group. Um, but um, we looked at the idea that Xerxes represents Christ on one level. Okay. And um, so this is an accept, acceptance that happens, but exactly what that scepter is, uh, I'm not 100% certain. I mean, it, it has to do with the authority of, and the power of the ruler. So, and, and we have in 4.11, um, it talks about this. And then in 5-2, when she comes in and, and Xerxes holds out 
the golden scepter, scepter, she actually touches the top of the scepter. And I'm not sure what that means. Okay. Now, in the Bible, what is the scepter of God? Well, the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Okay. Jesus Christ ruling with the scepter in Revelation 12.5. Yeah. So it, it has to do with God's kingdom. But being held out to someone. Uh, and there's also the promises that that Xerxes makes that um, Esther would receive even half the kingdom, which didn't doesn't seem to be just rhetoric on Xerxes part, that that actually did occur. She received half the kingdom. Um, especially if, if she is a Metris or a Metris, however you say her name, uh, who, who is the historic uh, queen that was mar married to Xerxes, which I'm 100% certain that that is her. Okay, now we're dealing with three different verses in Esther that have to deal with the scepter. Yeah, yeah, so verse, 4 verse 11 and 5 2. And the one that we just read here in eight. Yeah, 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 that as well. Now, it's interesting because Genesis only has the one reference to a scepter, and that's in 49.10. The okay. scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until he whose right is it is comes and the obedience of the people belongs to him. Right. And then you have numbers as well. A star shall arise out of Jacob and a scepter out of Israel. Or right. star come out of Israel, scepter arise out of star come out of Jacob, a scepter shall arise out of Israel. Um, so you have these scepters which seem to be connected to Christ. But we also have scepters in the book of Ezekiel. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting that the scepters occur four times in, in Ezekiel, but only in chapters 19 and 21. Ezekiel 19, you're saying, and 21? Ezekiel 19, 11. And 1914, are they not dealing oh. with scepters? Yeah, so I have 1914 in my search. Um, what about 1911? Yeah, that's that? scepters. Okay, so I didn't do the plural. I didn't search the plural. Yeah, so 1911 and right. 1914. Now, you also have it in, in Revelation 1. Uh, verse 8, I believe. And is it 1 8? No, that's not it. Where is it? Or oh, Hebrews 1 8, that's what I meant. Hebrews 1 8. And in Hebrews 1 8, um, this is where uh, Paul is quoting all these Old Testament verses in a proof text fashion. So he's actually just quoting the one from Psalms uh, chapter 45. Mm -hmm. um, but unto the son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Um, for thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And so this is where the, the throne or the scepter is being given to Christ. Now, going back to that with Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 21, verses 10 and 13. Okay. Do we not have scepter mentioned there as well? Um.
uh, talking about the rod? I'm just asking a question. Okay. Is the word that is in Ezekiel 21 the same word as translated as scepter? Yeah, I think so. Just hang on. I'm going to. Oh. My Bible got all mixed up here. Okay. Okay, so that word Shabbat. Um, yeah, so it's it's a rod, a scepter, a staff. Um, so that would be the same word. I'm not looking in the dictionary yet. I'm just looking at the. Okay, so uh, or the or not what I wanted to look at as I'm looking in the dictionary. I wanted to look in the. King James concordance, because that will show you all the verses where, it, so that verse, that word shows up lots of places as a rod. So there's 34 places where it's translated as rod, nine as scepter, two as staff. And uh, it also refers to tribes as well. Right, and that's interesting. that the tribe would also be either a scepter or a, a rod. Yeah. Well, th because the word itself, um, it comes from this idea of a, a branch or an offshoot. Right. So, so pretty much just like when you get, uh, you know, sort of like when you get a switching. Um, you know, it's a branch. It's also a rod. So it's a stick. It's a shaft. Um, so that so that's the relationship of the word. But obviously, the context would determine its meaning because it can be translated as truncheon, scepter, which has a mark of authority, clan and tribe, club that a shepherd uses, and it also refers to the shaft of a spear or a dart, and a rod or a staff. But the original meaning is is an offshoot, a branch. So quite interesting. So my my I guess my question results in this. Yeah. Here is here is a scepter. Yeah. Scepter is held out. This this becomes an emblem of grace, an emblem of mercy. Right. The rod, on the other hand, is a, it's more of a symbol of discipline. Right. And, and depending on the person's response. Right. Depends on which way you look at the scepter. Because God can hold out mercy or he can give uh, punishment with okay. a rod. So I think we did sort of say it was God's grace. It symbolized the grace. Okay. But it also symbolizes the authority of God. And if you take a scepter of righteousness as a scepter of thy kingdom, uh, if we're to have God's mercy or grace held out to us, what would that imply? Because he can't just hold it out to everyone that comes before him. No. The, the grace is held out. Isn't it for those that are seeking to be restored? Mm -hmm. They're seeking the reunion? Mm -hmm. So there, there's quite a bit that, that is being shown here. And there's quite a bit for us to have to consider. Yeah, and because in how we understand Esther, we understand her representing the work of the third angel. Right. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's the message of the third angel, but also the results of the message of the third angel. That's what she's representing. Right. And she's, so she's in, in Babylon. Um, and Mordecai, we, we understand him as representing the second angel or really the fourth angel. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's <laughs> how we came to understand it. So he's, he's the arrival of the second angel again. And especially when we look at the history and where we're placing the story of Esther, the story of Esther um, is under the second angel, but it's a typical line of something that's still going to be future. So, so let's, let's place it this way. Mordecai is the repeat and enlargement of the second angel. Yeah. So it's the equivalent of the fourth, but it's the repeat and enlargement of the second. Yeah. Okay. So in Esther 8.8, 8, write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. So here again, we have a nation of laws. Mm -hmm. We have a nation of that is under, let's say, a constitution. So as we are looking at this part of the story, as we are looking, here is the third, the experience of the third angel's message before it goes into the repeat and enlarge of the second. Mm -hmm. We have the experience of the people of that time being shown what's going to happen in our time today. Correct. And we have the ceiling that's going on. Right. We're going to have the Sunday law. Right. Now, Mordecai didn't write this. The king didn't write it. Esther didn't write it. The king's scribes were called at that time in the third month. That is the month of Sivan on the three and 20th day thereof. So the 23rd of Sivan. Now you were placing that on a line. Yeah. So, so that's March 7th. Okay. 473 BC. Um, oh, pardon me. That, that's incorrect. I said this wrong. Um, I'm looking at the wrong one. So, so um, the one that, that is given by Haman's decree goes into effect on March 7th, 473 BC. This decree that that comes from Esther, it's on the third day of the uh, 23rd day of the third month on the biblical calendar. Right. Uh, but the date is June 25th. And it's 256 days before March 7th. And June 25th is the 25th day of the sixth month. So so th the law is given on the 25th day of the sixth month on, on the Julian calendar. Um, but it's given 2,500 or 20, 25, six days or 256 days before Haman's decree. Also, it's the 23rd day of the third month and the third month, 23rd day is a symbol of 323. And that's the number of days from the end of the fast to March 7th. Um, 473 BC. So you have this, and it's also 66 days after um, that date. After, after, uh, I think actually after the first banquet. I'm not sure if it's after the first or the second one. I think it may be at 66 days from Haman being hanged. So, yeah, so there's lots of interesting things about this. I, I, I think the point that we have here is we have Haman's decree, which is the Sunday law. And then we have this counter decree. And what is the counter decree? That's, I guess, 
to understand what that symbolizes. I'm having trouble hearing you unless you're not talking. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know if this is a problem on this computer because I, I have responded. I mean, you're asking what is the, the symbol that we're, we're supposed to see here as far as the second decree, the, mm -hmm. the anti-decree. Yeah. Now, Haman's decree is one that we have, we've applied as being the Sunday law. Yes. So the anti-decree to that, would that not be that this is for the destruction of the papacy? How, how exactly would you phrase this? Okay, so one of the things we know is that this is obviously not the Sunday law. It is a type of the Sunday law. Right. So, um, and that distinction, I think, is important because of where it's placed. It's placed before the third a decree of, of dealing with, um, you know, it's before Artaxerxes' decree. Okay. Right. And, and so this, this parallels our history that happens before the Sunday law. But this is still a type of the Sunday law, which I would then line up with Samuel Snow's letters. And I look at, at the symbol then that we get from Samuel Snow's letters. And, and what we get from Samuel Snow's letters is we get the last letter, which is the prediction before midnight, is July 18th. Now, this March 7th date um, is on the 13th day of the 12th month of the 12th year. And 13 times 12 times 12 is 1872. So that's one tenth of the symbol that we use for uh, July 18, 2020. Now, a counter decree in the context of, of our history, what happened with July 18th? Was that something where a destruction was going to occur, but that destruction was reversed? That makes sense. The destruction was, was um, predicted, but yeah. it did not occur. Right, it didn't occur. And, and God's people don't get destroyed on March 7th, 473 BC, even though that's what appears that's going to happen. But there is a response to that. Um, and that's all I can gather here is that there's something about uh, this, this counter decree is a message counter to this other message. So there is a message that is to to, for destruction and there's a message uh, for protection. And, and I don't think we fully grasp everything here, but we have these dates and these symbols, and these dates and symbols show up in our line. They're connected to our line, and they're connected to the Sunday law also in 321, because in 321, we have a Sunday law on March 7th, Constantine's Sunday law. And then the period of time to our March 7th, Julian, if we, we do that math, if you remember, the relationship between the period between Haman's Sunday Law and the Sunday Law of Constantine to the whole period is pi. Right. Um, and if we refine it even more, it's pi plus 187. Which is, which is a fairly powerful symbol. Yeah. So, so to me, a lot of this history is actually applying to this movement as a type. Right. And, and that's where it gets a little bit dicey because what we have always done with this history is we've put it as the Sunday law. 
but it's actually a type of this movement and its relationship to the Sunday law. So I would say that Esther's decree is symbolic of a message from this movement. Okay. But we're saying that she's the third angel. But the or the work of the third angel. Right. And, and the work of the third angel was what the church had originally been raised up to give, but which the corporate church has refused to give. Right. And we're giving the first and second angels messages, but that's in preparation to give the third angels message. And the third angels message is going to be empowered at the Sunday law, which is, is, is typified by uh, this event that happens where Esther's decree is contrary or counters the decree of the Sunday law. So that would mean that we have a message to give that is going to counter the work of the papacy. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, as we continue. We got down to Esther 8.11, 8.12, and 8.13, and Daniel Vanderhorst had some points that he brought out on this. Now, 8.11, wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together, to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, to take the spoil of them for a prey. Upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Now, this later became Mordecai's feast, but was not initially one of the feasts that was ordained by God. Mm -hmm. Purim. Purim, yes. The great king Artaxerxes, unto the princes and governors of 120, 107 and 20 provinces from India unto Ethiopia, and unto all our faithful subjects, greeting. Right. And the point that we need to make here again, just for anybody watching, is that when it talks about Artaxerxes, and I've even found more evidence that this is, is a title. Okay. Um, and that one of the things that was really confusing for many people who were looking at the book of Esther and, and looking at, at what the Greek historians say, when they talk about Artaxerxes, um, sometimes they're referring to Xerxes because they call him Artaxerxes, not just Xerxes. Um, right. And, and so this, this was a really interesting point. I'm actually reading a book a guy wrote uh, regarding this, some of this history. He's actually more dealing with um, uh, uh, Cyrus and Darius the Mede. But in doing so, he gives all the evidence for these, these names being titles, not being the actual name of the person. So... Is, you know, Pharaoh is not a name. Pharaoh right. is a title. Yeah. So, so you're you're finding more evidence of this then. Yeah. As I'm researching it. Yeah. Okay. Many, the more often they are honored with great bounty of their benefactors, the more proud they are waxen and endeavor to hurt not our subjects only, but not being able to bear abundance, do take in hand to practice also against those that do them good. And take not only thankfulness away from among men, but also lift it up with the glorious words of needy persons that never tasted prosperity, 
they think to escape the justice of God that seeth all things and hateth evil. Now, all of this is being written in a letter under Ahasuerus slash Artaxerxes slash Xerxes signet. Yeah, but it's written by his scribes. It's written by the scribes, correct. Oftentimes also fair speech of our friends put in trust to manage the affairs hath caused many that are in authority to be partakers of innocent blood and hath enwrapped them in remediless calamities. Beguiling with all the falsehood and deceit of their lewd disposition, the innocence and goodness of princes. Now, all of this in blue is part of the Apocrypha. Yeah. And had been set aside after 1825. Mm -hmm. But it has, it's been adding to a lot of the points that we're looking at and that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Here in 1616, technically a doubling. Yeah. And they be children of the most high and most mighty living God who hath prospered the kingdom both unto us and to our progenitors in the most excellent manner. Now, this is not coming from a pagan that doesn't know God. This is coming from a, a man such as Mordecai. Yeah. Who has a relationship with the living God, right? Mordecai has the signet ring. And this is, is probably being dictated by him to the scribes. Right. Wherefore, you shall do well not to put in execution the letters sent unto you by Haman, the son of Hamadatha. For he that was the worker of these things is hanged at the gates of Susa with all his family. God who ruleth all things speedily rendering vengeance to him according to his deserts. So my question here is, mm -hmm. if, if Haman has been hung with all his family, mm -hmm. that means that Haman has been hung, his sons have been hung, does that also mean his wife has been hung? Yes, his wife would be hung. Why? Because his whole family would be hung. Why? Because that's what they did. Why? Did, what did his wife do? She was one of the evil ones. You, oh, you... right. She was too. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot about that. Don't worry. We're not going to get hung. <laughs> 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 everyone needed a comedy break yeah so so there's some interesting points here now uh, we haven't haven't actually read yet about Haman's sons being hung have we oh, yeah. we did, yeah, we did. Yeah. where was that weren't they hung the very next day after Haman was that way back there yeah because oh. so. it says Haman is hanged at the end of chapter 7 And then in chapter eight, it doesn't mention it. It just mentions it here in this, this letter. Isn't it implied somewhere? Yeah, but I thought there is a section where it talks about the hanging of Haman's, uh, at least- It was, we covered it already. Pretty sure. Uh, we have to get into the next chapter, which is going through, and it doesn't speak of the sons, it doesn't give their name until Esther 9, 7 to 9, 10. Right, yeah, so it's in chapter 9, but it mentions in this letter that his whole family has been hanged. Well, so, would this, would this portion, I mean, the, the way that I was, I was looking at this was that this with the decree needed yeah. to be combined with chapter eight, would it be better if it was combined with chapter nine? Well, well, okay. So, well, they're probably going back and forth, but yeah, so chapter eight, they mentioned this letter or this decree 
being written, um, and then they they give it. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe it would be put. But see, when you get to chapter nine, it's going to mention the events, um, and then it's just going to mention. Um, let me see here. If you start at nine six and go through nine ten, it gives the names. But prior to that, it also gives the date, being the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, Adar. Yeah. See, so. Okay, the Jews smote their enemies with the stroke of the sword. Yeah, so it's saying that they're being slain in chapter 9. And the letter says... Um, Yeah, now this is this is normally placed. Um, yeah, see, I don't think it should be here. This is more after all these things have happened. On the 13th day of the 12th month, and that gives you the time time to appear. Hmm. Because this is more talking about after everything has been wrapped up. This. Though it does say at the end, you shall aid them even the same day being the 13th day of the 12th month, Adar, that they may be avenged on them who in the time of their affliction shall set upon them. So it's kind of confusing. I'm going to have to think about this. Because this is then going to be distributed, it says, to everyone. Um, but then it says that it's actually not until the 13th day of the 12th month that Haman's sons are slain. sons basically have to wait nine months to be slain? Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. Oh, it's like it's like placing someone on death row. Yeah. Why would they wait that long? That didn't make it doesn't make sense. Mm. Isn't it a parallel to Eli and his sons? His sons. His sons died first, and then Eli died. Right. Right. I agree. Right after. But the the parallel here, as I'm looking at it, Heidi, is the 10 sons could represent the, the 10 governors or 10 princes that we see in Revelation. Okay. Mm -hmm. That they serve with the beast, but are then destroyed after the papacy is destroyed. Um, now, it could be, though, see, I'm trying to figure this out, because it's talking about what happens on the, the 13th day of the 12th month. Right. It talks about all the different people that were slain. Now, it could be that this reference, because they're talking about that they spoiled their enemies. Right? So they were able to take the spoil. But it says the 10 sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews slew they, but on the spoil laid not their they not their hand um so it may be that they were just it's just referencing back to the fact that they were slain but that they didn't take the spoil i don't i don't know if that's correct or not though um but it is a bit of a puzzle um so they could have taken the spoil hmm I mean, we're, we're looking at a situation where the those of the children of God had to be prepared to defend themselves. This was not going to be something that was just going to go out in a single day. 
there's 127 provinces that have to be notified. Mm -hmm. So they're sending this out to 127 provinces. They're saying, be prepared. You have this right. Mm -hmm. This is the way it is right now. So there's questions now as to what we're seeing, whether this is going to be a chiasm for what we find at the end, whether there is something else that we are not yet addressing and that we need to address in reference to this passage in scripture. Yeah, it seems like reading this that the 10 sons of Haman are slain on the 13th day of the 12th month. Okay. Um, because in verse 13, then say, okay, I know we're going to chapter nine here. We should probably start, finish that, and then go into chapter nine. Right. More. That's, that's probably what my plan is right now. Yeah. So, so I guess at that time when it says his, his family was slain, um, it didn't include his 10 sons. Okay. It would have included his wife, uh, his household that was with him there. Uh, but we don't know where Haman's 10 sons are, oh. particularly. So maybe I just assumed it included his 10 sons. Well, I, I assume that. But here it's clear that it's, it's, it's later that his 10 sons are killed. Okay, so let's back up, take the reins there. Okay, so a straight chain in the Hebrew, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was revealed unto all people and that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. So the posts that rode upon mules and camels went out being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment and the decree was given at Sushan, the palace. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple and the city of Sushan rejoiced and was glad. So Daniel's, the, the point that we were making here mm -hmm. was Haman never went out with a change of raiment. Mordecai goes out with a change of raiment. The fourth angel is announcing that this message, this repeat and enlarge of the second angel is calling people out of Babylon. Here is Mordecai and he's making an announcement in Babylon, technically in Sushan, right? Mm -hmm. Now, after this message goes out, after it is received in all of the world, where people have made their choice one way or the other, yeah. then we know that and in Revelation, the plagues fall. And when the plagues have fallen, Christ then changes his raiment. Mm -hmm. He goes from being priest to being king right? Yeah. Okay. So you're looking at this as a chiasm. Correct. I am. So the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. Now, light helps us to understand our path. We are glad, especially when we are in worship, we find joy when we find that we are not judged as guilty and we have honor when we have come through the test. In a very similar way, I mean, we've, we've talked about this before as justification, sanctification, judgment, and glorification. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you, is, is that 
to possible to be seen in Esther 816? Yes. That, I mean, is that a correct application is what I'm getting at? Well, this describes a reform line to me. Okay. Right, the increase of light. Um, and this is the positive side of the reform line. Okay. So gladness, joy, honor. So that's the wise virgins. Right. Okay. And in every province and in every city, wheresoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. It's interesting to me that this verse refers that the Jews had joy and gladness. Mm -hmm. So if we make that application back, they're talking about, in reverse order, the third and the second message, but they're ignoring the first and the fourth. Yeah, so they're doing it backwards. But, um, but it is sort of implying the honor. Right. And now light, um, just going to look at this here a second. I mean, this should be the normal word for light. Yeah, aura, luminousness. Um, so it's not the typical word, it's a feminine form of the word light. Because um, or is light, this is aura. Um, it also refers to prosperity. Okay. So, of the four verses that use this particular form of the word, we have one in Second Kings, one in Esther, one in Psalms 139, and one in Isaiah. Okay. So, and what, what's really interesting is only Esther and Psalm translated as light. Psalms 139.12. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Mm -hmm. But in 2 Kings and in Isaiah, the word is translated herbs. Right, because there's actually a plant that um, is 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 given the same name it's a plant is called um aura okay. but there's a lot more places where this this word exists um i'm just going to talk to what, what i was able to look up quickly yeah but but it exists in a different form okay you know because in genesis uh, one verse three, the first time we have light mentioned. Um, it's just or. So it's not or ah. Mm -hmm. um, let me just see. I'm going to look at the Hebrew itself. For it to be in the feminine form. Would that also not be a a like a religious light as distinct from say sunlight? Well, no. It's just that in the feminine form it can it has different meanings like the herb or the plant or prosperity. When it's in just the regular form, uh, it refers to to light or sunlight. Or morning so it's just in in the different forms it's gonna it's gonna be applied differently so it because and that's what you do in hebrew right so you you change the form of the word um when you apply it to different things 
but here it's just uh, like the Hebrew numbers 2115 or the other ones 2116 or, or the other way around. So um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I just. And then in the chat is Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. So what we would have there would be the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Okay. So, now we will shift. I don't know if this will work this way or if I need to do it a different way. So be bear with me for just a yeah. second. Okay, does that does that show Esther nine on the screen? Yeah, worked perfectly. Okay. So <clears throat> The Jews, assisted by rulers through fear of Mordecai's power, slay their enemies and the 10 sons of Haman among the rest. Then by verse 12, Ahasuerus, as, at the request of Esther, granteth to the Jews as Shushan another day of slaughter and causes Haman's sons to be hanged. Verse 20, the two days of Purim, are made anniversary festivals in commemoration of this deliverance. So, Esther 9.1. Now in the 12th month, that is the month of Adar, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them for the fear of them fell upon all people. Now, when, when I was putting this together, Esther 9.1 gives a cross-reference in 2 Samuel 22.41. Mm -hmm. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. Now, who was speaking here? Was that not David? Yeah, that's David. Okay. Because in 2 Samuel 22, it has to be David. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's David's song of deliverance. Now, for the fear of them fell upon all people. Here we deal with Esther 8, 17, but to lay hand on such as sought their hurt gives us both Psalm 71, 13 and Psalm 71, 24. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. My tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all day long, for they are confounded, for they are brought unto shame that seek my hurt. Esther 9.3. And all the rulers of the provinces 
and the lieutenants and the deputies and those which did the business that belonged to the king helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. So the rulers helped them, their lieutenants helped them, and the lieutenants deputies, and anybody that was doing business that belonged to the king. So could we also say that the tax collectors helped them? I guess. So why would somebody oppose the Jews when you have so much going against you? Well, why would why would somebody choose to set aside the third angel's message, which is an invitation to life, mm -hmm. and accept the mark of the beast, which is condemnation of death? So I would think what you have to have is the same type of hatred that Haman had toward the Jews that must have existed in some of the people in Persian. Right. It wasn't just about, you know, that they can get money. They actually hated the Jews. Okay. Now it's interesting trying to read the history of Persia because um, there isn't a lot surviving. Uh, okay. Most of what we know about Persia is, is actually from the Greeks. And of course the Greeks really despised the Persians and um, they definitely um, put them in a bad light. Right. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, you know, historians in trying to look at the story of Esther and say, did it occur? You know, is the Bible account just made up or myth or whatever? Um, you know, they're depending a lot on the Greeks, who, of course, are distorting the whole story about because they just looked at the Persians like, uncultured animals compared right. to them. Yeah, if you look at, because uh, we watched, Heidi and I watched a video on Persophilus. So Persophilus is just the city of Persia, the Persian city, right? Uh, that's the Greek's name for it. And, and obviously that's not the, uh, the Persian name for it. Um, but that city compares to anything that the Greeks did. So the Persians uh, definitely had a high uh, culture, but their destruction is kind of a mystery. Why Persia didn't survive is kind of a mystery um, because it did sort of implode from it within, from what we know. Right. Um, and the city of Persophilus itself was dependent upon um, the system of irrigation that they used because the Persians loved gardens. Um, they're very into to nature. And, um, you know, they look at this system and they say it was just too fragile uh, in Persophilus to survive. Uh, it just needed uh, certain situations, whether it was flood or drought and, and that whole system could fall apart, which is what happened um, from what they gather. So um, the point I'm making is that we don't know a lot about this history um, other than the Greeks. And, and I believe that the Bible gives the true account, of course. But we would see that the Jews, like they do every time that they, um, they come into uh, being oppressed, one of the things they do is they, they handle money and finance and trade. And, and this could be the very situation that occurred in Persia as well. We just don't have a record of it um, other than the Bible account. Okay. So. Okay, for Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out throughout all the provinces 
for this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. Now, here again, 2 Samuel 3, 1. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. First Chronicles 11, 9 seconds that. Proverbs 4, 18. But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Verse 9, 5. <clears throat> Thus the Jews smote all of their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them, or they did according to their will unto all of those that hated them. And in Sushan the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. Why did they why did they slay 500? What's the significance here? As a symbol, you mean 500? Right. I'm not certain. Okay. Something for us to consider. Now the next several verses. And Parshandatha and Dalphon and Asphatha, Horatha and Adalia and Aridtha and Parmashata, Arasai, Aradai and Vajizatha. Now, I should have prepared on this to look up these names to well, see what the names meant. Yeah. Um, now the thing is, I did do some work on that. Okay. Um, what I mostly found is that these are Persian names, so that's okay. one thing that's agreed upon. Um, and and that's one thing if you're going to have this as being something that's created later, uh, it's pretty hard. Uh, to make up names, right? Uh, just, it's, it's, it's just not as easy as you would think. Now, I have here just from the Brown Drivers Briggs. Um, it ha I don't don't think it has all of them, but um, Par Shandadatha means given by prayer. Okay. Uh, Dalphon means dripping. Aspatha, uh, the enticed gathered. Poratha is um, fruitfulness or frustration, which seemed not really um, similar to me. Adalia is, I shall be drawn up of Yah. So this actually has this reference to uh, a Persian name that has actually has some some Hebrew backing. And if you think about Haman, uh, what is his background? No. I mean, he's not Jewish, right? No. He's, he's opposed. So that so this would show some of the influence that you would see uh, amongst the Persians from the Hebrews that he might not even be aware of in naming one of his sons, that name. Um, uh, and Aradatha is the lion of the decree. Parmastha or Parmashta is superior. Arasai is lion of my banners. And I have a question mark by it. Um, Aradai is the lion is enough. And you can see that it's that first part of that Ariel, you're familiar with the name Ariel, right? Right. What does it mean? I'm familiar with the name. I don't know the meaning. It means Lion of God, right? right. Um, and is another name for the city of, of Jerusalem. Right. So that's why that airy part, in, and, and there's some similarities there. And then Vajazatha 
is uh, strong as the wind. So those are the names of the 10 sons. Um, it's interesting, strong as the wind. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the east wind, or in the Greek, the Euros, would be, we would look at that as being Islam. Mm -hmm. But I also look at that one on Karmashatha because of the meaning. I mean, we've gone through this in the past where the name Parmender, meaning God of gods, is a, um, I mean, that's to me a blasphemous name. Yeah. I didn't know if that's what Parminder meant. I didn't. Uh, what? God of gods. Oh, well. You look that up in the, in the um, look up his name on that one. And that, that was one of the reasons I was always having trouble having to even accept that he would be a leader within this movement. Yeah, it means God of gods in Hindi. Mm. or Punjabi Sikh, the name of Parminder. It's most often the name of a boy, male. Um, in Hindu, Indian, Punjabi Sikh, the boy, male name, uh, Parminder means God of gods. Mm. I mean, my name means gift of God, but that's, uh, um, that's not blasphemous. No, not at all. So here we have the 10 names. Now it's interesting to me that we get this in a three, three, four um, arrangement. In, yeah, in the verses there. Right. So, I mean, they, they could have done it with, you know, two names in five verses, but here they decided to do in three verses a three, three, four breakdown. So there has to be some reason that that was done. Yeah, I mean, they could have did it all, done it all in one verse too. Yeah. yeah so. so verse verse 10, the 10 sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they, but on the spoil, they laid not their hand. Mm -hmm. On that day, the number of those that were slain in Sushan, the palace, came before the king. So now we're being told that the total number slain in Sushan was reported to the king. Now, do the 10, are, are they separate from the 500 or are they part of the 500? Yeah, I don't know. That's because if, if they're if they're part of it, then we have a 490 and we have a 10. Yeah. Okay. What's that? A rad? Okay. Yeah, there's noise in the background there man. and okay so i i find that to be intriguing as well because we've talked about the 490 for the king we've talked about the 490 for the temple the 490 for the people yeah now, here would be a 490 would that would that mean that this was an end of probation for uh, the Amalekites? Well, that's interesting. Yeah, um, possibly that's what it would mean. Um, I can't say for certain. I mean, because otherwise what we, what we would have is we would have the number 510 
but it's reported that there were 500 in Sushan. So yeah. just, just an observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm still thinking about it. Okay. And the king said unto Esther the queen, the Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Sushan the palace and the 10 sons of Haman. So this verse is answering the question. You have 510. Okay. There you okay. Go. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee, or what is thy request further? And it shall be done. So we have 510. Yeah. that have been slain in Sushan on that day. So is this representative of the fifth day of the 10th month? Or the 10th day of the fifth month? Either way. Well, the 10th day of the fifth month would be the date from Ezekiel for the destruction of the temple. And it's one of the dates we used for July 18th, the destruction of the temple in Nashville as a symbol. Okay. Though we placed it normally on the 26th day of the fourth month, but of course that date, July 18th also falls on the 10th day of the fifth month. Just the Julian date does. Then said Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews, which are in Sushan, to do tomorrow also according unto this day's decree, and let men hang upon the gallows. So Esther here is saying, then if it pleases the king, she's asking that it be granted that the 10 sons of Haman be hanged upon the gallows. So this is a repeat. We've already been told in right. one place that the 10 sons have been hanged and now she's requesting them to be hanged. Mm -hmm. Why? So, um, so I think what it's saying here is the 10 sons of Haman are gonna be killed. Um, but yeah, this is going to be the day after that they're going to be killed. Day after Haman's? 13th Are they day dead already? Maybe they're already dead. Yeah, that's that's a question I'm asking. Yeah. So do you hang a dead man? Yes. Okay. Why? Why do they hang dead men? Why do they put peace, people's heads on spears? No, it's a dem it's a, as a statement. Yeah, statements. Well, I, you know, I, I remember well from history that they held what was called the Cadaver Synod in Rome, where they actually decided to put a dead pope to death. Oh. And they burned uh, people's bones, dug them up and burned them after they condemned them. Right. Yeah. Okay, so so they must be dead to be hung. Right. I mean, the cadaver scene took place against a, a pope called Clemente. And he'd been dead for about seven months. Okay. The trial was conducted by Pope Stephen the yeah. Fifth. Yeah, you need to talk more directly into the computer. It's muffled when you're facing away. Sorry, sorry about that. That's okay. I have to. I'll have to get my other computer out so that um, that it picks up better. Yeah. So that that synod was in 897 A.D. and was conducted by Pope Stephen the Sixth. Okay. Okay, so this makes sense. 
yeah because i knew that that the that this this hadn't come yet so but i always thought that they were killed by being hung so did i um so yeah they're they're going to be killed the next day right. or not killed but hung the next day and the king commanded to be done and the king was sent out to say and they hung Haman's sons so Haman's 10 sons so I mean we're taking the 10 sons to represent the UN right okay one of the comments in the chat Esther 9 7 the beginning of the list of Haman's sons could be 9.719 when Jeff blitzed the Omega. Okay, so September 7th, 2019. How would we how would that we make that application? Well, wasn't that wasn't that Jeff's return to the pulpit? Yeah. Wasn't that the basically the revelation of the issue that had really occurred with with the Omega movement? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember that whole week and and the days following. It was very okay. confusing what was going on. Um, but Jeff brought a lot of clarity to the issue. The other thing that brought clarity for me was the date itself. Okay. Because I realized it was part of our structure of July 18th. So, so that was interesting. And th that also gave us March 27th, 2019, because it was halfway between September, um, uh, September 7th, 2019 and October 13th, uh, 2018. So, but I'm just saying that in trying to say that this refers to the sun, how, how do we make the parallel exactly? What's the idea there? I just read it from the chat. I just, I find it interesting. Maybe, um, who made the sister that Angela? Okay, Angela. Well, Angela, you would have to explain it. I don't know. I just thought that verse nine, chapter nine, verse seven, and then that automatically brought my mind back to September 7th when Jeff came out with this big expose. Okay, I see what you're the other. I never. Yeah, even and I thought, well, they were bringing us back to the world that. Ten sons represent the UN, which is the world, you know, so. That's oh. all. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then in verse 915, for the Jews that were in Sushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day also of the month of Adar and slew 300 men at Sushan, but on the prey, they laid not their hand. So that would mean that we would have 810 that would have been slain in Sushan. 500 one day, 300 the next, plus the 10. Okay. So is there a symbol that we can draw from this? Okay, so we got, yeah, let's see here. I'm just reading ahead.
because they slew 75,000, it says here, all together um, on the 13th day of the 12th month. And um, and then so they actually took three days, uh, well, two days, and then the fifteenth day they rested. So they took two days, the thirteenth and the fourteenth. So they added that second day. Anyway, let's just go on. Uh, there's a lot of here here to absorb. Okay, well, question I'm going to ask from from the Hendrix observer: When would the 13th and the 14th day of Adar been in the week? Um, Well, this would have been um, a Thursday and a Friday, and then the day that they rested would be the Sabbath, I think. Just hang on. I got to check. I got to double check here. Um So we got to get, okay. okay, so the 13th of Adar in 473 BC in the 12th year of Xerxes, so that's March 7th. That would have been a Friday, according to this, unless I'm looking at this wrong. And so the 14th would be a Sabbath and the Sunday. That's according to the Babylonian calendar that we have here. Does it make sense that they would have been on a same thing here, same with the biblical calendar. So the, um, well, hang on, they go a day different. Hmm. So if we, if we use the biblical calendar, the 13th would have been the Thursday and the 14th would have been the Friday, but they would have been using the Babylonian calendar. So, the 13th would have been a Friday, the Saturday would have been the 14th, and the Sunday being the 15th. Does it make sense that they would have been slaughtering their animals? Okay, I'm having trouble hearing you. Does it make sense that they would have been slaughtering their enemies on the Sabbath? No, but they're defending themselves on the Sabbath. They do the slaughtering on the Friday. But it's Two days in a row. But they're defending themselves on the Sabbath. Um, but that's I, I guess what I'm looking at is if we use this as our point to close, we return yeah. to this this next week and examine this in greater detail. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I haven't looked in this as much detail as I should have. But um, there's a lot that comes because just reading it superficially, you know, right. you go through and you think you understand what it's talking about. But you start to really look at it closely, it becomes a lot more, uh, a lot of things you have to consider. Right. So, yeah, we'll take a look at that uh, next week. So, shall we close? Yeah. Okay. Gracious Father in heaven, I 
Again, we thank you for these examples that you have provided for us in your word. We thank you for the examples that you are providing of your character and of your spirit. Guide us now, Father, through the balance of this day. Help us to prepare for that that you would have us to do. Direct us in all that we do so that others may see your character in our actions, in our speech, and in the way in which we deport ourselves. Be with those that have been in this study. Be with those that will view it later. For this, Father, we ask and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.